Good evening and welcome to tonight's Driver's Ed class. As we normally do, we'll wait for people to sign in. Remember to do it on your phone as well as sign in on YouTube in the comment section. So I've got to uh, get a few things here ready before we start tonight. Trying to get my desktop here ready. Uh, I do have a new light, so you're going to see probably a reflection in my glasses. Uh, I have new glasses, so I'm trying to get used to looking at the screen. It's going to take me, I think, a few days to get used to these glasses. They've really uh, stepped up the prescription, and uh, it's tough getting old when your eyes start to go. Looks like we're almost up to a full class. This is good. We're getting up there. So tonight, we're going to try to pick up on uh, the turning section that we had to kind of push off because we were running out of time one night. So we're going to start off with a section on turning, um, following distance, passing, lane changes, uh, things like that. And then we're going to get into stopping and speed. I do have openings for tomorrow. Um, I've left them up there in the corner. So I want you to write these down and I want you to think about while we're having class, whether these times are going to uh, fit into your schedule. So let me know. I have 11, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 open tomorrow. I know we're all gearing up for what next week will look like. Um, I believe because there is no school on Monday because of the teacher's workshop and they're getting their shots, which I will also be getting mine. Um, I plan to have a good full day of driving. So Monday may look a lot like what we have going on uh, tomorrow. So um, I'm going to just speak out to uh, Leah. Uh, we usually drive, I believe, Wednesday mornings at 8 o'clock just send me a text to let me know whether that still works out for you. I don't want to assume. So, um, because I believe I gave you the eight o'clock time. So please let me know if that still works for you. All right, let's kind of get right to it. So, uh, we'll talk about the midterm tomorrow, uh, tomorrow, the midterm is tomorrow, but we'll talk about it at the end of tonight's class. We won't do it here at the beginning. Um, so let me just get out of the music, get right into our section on turning and signaling. Uh, once you start to learn to drive and your parents have probably taken you from the parking lot to the back roads and you start going into traffic situations, you really have to be perfect when it comes to making turns because other cars depend upon it. I think a lot of you know that I'm a stickler for being positioned in your lane, getting ready to make turns, uh, try to stay close to your speed uh, that's posted because uh, I'm trying to train you and get you to the point where when you go for your driver's test, you're so used to hearing me in the back of your head saying, you know, watch your position, watch your speed, check your mirrors. It's going to be second nature. I'm trying to build that muscle memory uh, into your driving. Now, this section right here on turning and signaling, we want to basically do the same thing with muscle memory. Um, turning and making some type of movement to the left, to the right while you're driving really comes down to, as it says here, vision and judgment. So if you don't see things well, because we know pedestrians can be hidden by other parked cars, uh, cars that are stopped making left-hand turns, maybe um, the post between your front windshield and your side uh, window, you're going to have things hidden. You've got to overcome some of these obstacles and situations and problems and still be able to function as a, as a good, safe driver. So what we're trying to do is to give you the tools, give you the information where you're processing a lot of these things in your head 
before they actually happen. I'm a firm believer that when you're given more time, you're going to have a better uh, chance of dealing with a situation effectively and correctly. I think if you see something at the last second, just on the opposite side of the spectrum, don't expect for things to turn out really, really well. Um, I know the police are in the news uh, right now, uh, another police shooting, but this has nothing to do with a shooting, but it does have to go to training. Uh, police spend a lot of time training, not only with how they interact with the public. Uh, in, in the case right now in the news, it's all about firearms, but I want to kind of gear it towards their operation of their cruiser. Because they're driving at such high speeds, they really have to know how to control uh, their car so they don't have a situation. And I, I thought this was just, I guess a part of me I felt that this was a little bit humorous. Maybe you'll see the humor in it too. So let me just run the video. This is the corner of Firestone and Bandera. This furniture store here and you can see that hole there it's the shape of a chp cruiser because during that so, pursuit that's what we saw that cruiser went right through it we have earlier tape of that this is a pursuit roll that the, started at 4 45 this so here's morning a here we go we're going to slow it down for you that white sedan there he slows down the makes his turn quick turn there onto bandera and the chp cruiser right into that building but good news is, is, is the officer was not injured at least not injured seriously now there are two things that come to mind. He couldn't have been that bad of a driver that he was going to go into a building like that. So deep down, I think it's probably a malfunction with the brakes. But still, when you look at it, you go, whoa, did he have no control over his brake or his speed that he had to go into that building like that? Um, but he definitely wasn't slowing down. So before your brakes go, you should know that your brakes are going. And that's going to be something we talk about on Thursday about vehicle equipment malfunctions, uh, what to deal, how to deal with driving emergencies. But this just goes to show if you do not take a turn at the right speed, there are going to be consequences. You're not going to be able to make a good turn. Now, we haven't really honed in when you're driving with me about when should you put your directional on. So this, I want you to write this down. This section right here has a lot of questions on the midterm. So I would be taking some notes. So you have uh, a way to study tonight, tomorrow, uh, before the test. So this will look familiar to you. So this first one, I do want you to write down. As we said from the get-go, all decisions that you make as a driver, more time, you're going to be more reliable. So what I want you to write down, you should be looking at least 20 to 30 seconds up ahead from where you're driving. So you're looking for intersections. You're looking for pedestrians. You're looking for traffic lights. It gives you time to think, what do I really have to hone in on? What is really going to happen up there before I get there? Now, when it comes to making a turn, and we had this last week, move to the proper position. So the proper position that you should be familiar with, the way that I want you to handle your turns is when I say make a left-hand turn, you're going left of center towards the break in the yellow line. When I want you to make a right-hand turn, you're going right of center and going to the break of the white line. Breaking as you approach the break in the yellow or white line. You don't want to wait last second to break to make your turn. Now, as you're getting positioned, you're also putting on your signal. Your signal should always be put on at least 100 feet in town. And I know a lot of you are saying, I don't know what 100 feet looks like. I don't know what 500 feet looks like. I get it. I understand it. So let's break it down to something that you may be able to figure out what 100 feet looks like. In your notes, 100 feet in town is pretty close to two telephone poles. So look at where the break in the yellow line is or white line, find a telephone pole near that intersection, come back one telephone pole, then put your signal on. The longer you have it on, 
there's more of a chance that people are going to think that you're turning at a different roadway, that you're turning at a driveway. Uh, you're going to give uh, people a sense that you're turning before you actually are, and that's going to confuse them. Now, on a highway, there are less places where you can get off. They're only on, on ramps and off ramps. So you're not really confusing people, but it's not necessary until you probably get to your last traffic sign. Could be the exit number. It could be a blue sign telling you about services, but I would find where my exit is and then, you know, put my directional on one sign before the exit number and then follow the white line as it pulls you off the roadway. So, Always check your mirror when you get ready to put your signal on. And you know that I've been har harping after you to put your signal on when you put, uh, check your mirrors when you put your signal on. And then when you finish the turn, check your mirrors again. If you're in town, I would check your blind spot in the direction that you want to turn. Now in your notes, what I want you to write down, the reason why you're doing this, this is for in town. This would not be on a roadway that's 35, 40 miles per hour, but at speeds where you're traveling less than 20, or 25, I would check my blind spot when you get ready to make a turn because of bicycles, scooters, skateboarders. Because your speed is so slow, you may go by them um, and get up to where your turn is and you forgot that you went by them. And before you know it, they're right beside you and you lost a sense of where they are. Bicycles and skateboards, as you know, in town, do not normally follow traffic rule. So even though they see you there with your directional line, they may not stop. That's why you got to check your blind spot. Now, you don't have to write these two bullets down, but I find this to be helpful for people that are just beginning to learn how to make decent turns. When you make a right-hand turn, I would probably make it between 5 and 10 miles per hour, depending on the severity of how sharp it is. The sharper it is, the slower you go. If it's just a gentle uh, right-hand turn, it's not a 90 degree, then you could probably go at least 10, maybe a little bit faster than that. But a left-hand turn with no traffic, you can go slow and slightly faster than what you would for a right-hand turn. But with traffic, remember, you're not going to cut cars off on a left-hand turn. You have to stop, wait for them to go by, and then make your turn. The way to remember about turning left in front of cars is that before you make the turn, think in your mind, if I go to make my turn, are they going to have to break to help me out? If you're making a left-hand turn and the car coming towards you has to break, then you did not yield correctly. That's a bad situation for you to make a left-hand turn. Remember, if there is a crash, you are no longer in your lane. You're in theirs. You're going to be found at fault. So it's better to wait. And the other thing you'll hear me say probably a lot during this uh, presentation, it's, it's better to wait for your best opening rather than take your first opening. A lot of people think, oh, I think I can squeeze in. Well, look further down the road. Is there another opportunity within the next 10, 15, 20 seconds that may be slightly better? I would take that. So that kind of gets into this definition. I want you to write down the definitions between gap and hole. In this definition, most people are going to get the um, definition incorrect. A lot of people think that a hole is, um, or a gap is bigger than a hole. But when it comes to traffic and the way that they've got it in the curriculum here, a gap is really a small space between vehicles, probably less than two seconds. A hole is between a cluster. And remember we saw the video uh, in, in town, they talk about a platoon of cars that are grouped together. So we're really talking about a platoon of cars and you're finding two platoons and the distance between the two is your hole. So a hole is much larger than a gap, which is going to create less risk. It's going to give you better following distance in front of your vehicle. It's going to give you better following distance behind your vehicle. Now, a lot of you that don't have a lot of driving experience, you definitely want to find the biggest hole possible. Some of you have done a lot of driving and you're doing very well of making decisions when to pull out in traffic. There are still some of you that have opportunities and you don't take it. I understand it. 
I support it. But on a driver's test, I want you to realize if you do not take an opportunity to pull out into traffic, it may, now remember, this is may, not all the times, it may give them the indication that you are either scared and nervous, okay, or that you don't have the judgment and skill necessary to pull out in front of cars. So it has more of a negative thing if you don't do it when you should. I definitely don't think you should let, you know, two or three go by where you could go out. I could see one opening that you let go by, but you better take the next one um, because they could get a little bit leery of what type of driver that you are. Uh, always making vision checks at intersections. I find that the more comfortable you get with driving, the more we just focus between the yellow center line and the white edge line. We might look a little bit left, a little bit right, but we're really not too concerned about, you know, maybe people on sidewalks or cars that are coming from driveways or off at intersections. So I would advise you to learn to turn your head and kind of scan more left and right while you're driving in heavy traffic. So I want you to write this down. This is not in the manual. This is not in the textbook. This is me. This is something that I came up with that I feel is really the the three steps uh, before pulling out in front of a car at a stop sign. We've talked about pulling out into a hole. So when you turn out in front of other cars, you've got to say to yourself, can I answer these questions in the affirmative? Can I say yes to each question? The first one is, do they have their signal on? Yeah, okay, they do. I can see a directional. So I'm, I'm believing that they're going to turn in front of me. Now remember, some people have left turn signals on and some people put their signals on way before they should. So just answer the question. Do they have the turn signals on? Okay, yes. Next question you gotta answer. Do you see a change of their speed? Are they slowing down or are they maintaining speed? If you see a car with a directional and they haven't changed their speed, they're not turning in front of you. They're going further up the road. And lastly, have they changed their position? Have they gone to the right of center on a right-hand turn? Since you're pulling out, that's what you're looking for. Or are they going left of center, getting ready to make a left-hand turn, depending on what type of an intersection is. So you have to answer in the affirmative on all three questions here. Some of the common problems that we find with people when they make bad turns, first of all, and it's not up here, is you're not grabbing the wheel correctly and, and turning it smoothly and effectively to make a turn. So you know, all of you, that when I've taken you out for the first time, I've taken you either in a parking lot or back roads and I've, uh, or hills, looking at your hand position, how are you grabbing the wheel, how are you making your turns? But most people, once they get used to driving, the biggest problem they have is they're going too fast for the turn. They're going uh, too wide to the uh, right on a left-hand turn. They're going over the white line. Or if they're making a right-hand turn, they're going over the yellow line. Some of you don't use directionals when you should, or you put them on late. Understeering or oversteering is usually uh, related to the first bullet of going too fast, is where you have to compensate for the mistake that you made with your steering. Some of you don't know your left from your right or you get confused, which is understandable, but it's gonna to be tough when you're out on the road. If you're signaling right and you turn left, you're gonna screw with people and you may hit them. Can't find the turning area. This is where you're not making adequate search pattern to find the break in the line, the street sign, other cars coming out, the back end of stop signs. You could see street lights in the wintertime, a gap in the snowbank. There are many, many ways to find where you're turning. You just have to use your eyes and look. Left the directional on too long. Now, this I do want you to write down. It Now, I say it's question 96. The manual used to give you sample questions to uh, practice, and they've done away with the major bulk of questions, and they've narrowed it down and I don't I think it's kind of useless if you look at the back of your manual the sample questions that they give you are only 11 questions I mean that's not a, a good representation of what you've read in the state manual what you've gone over in driver's ed so that's why we're going to have a test tomorrow 
and why we're going to have a final in this class so we can kind of put you through the paces to see what you remember. So here is what I want you to write down in your notes for signaling. This is when you should have your signal on anytime you're changing lanes. Right to left, left to right, need them on. Turning at an intersection, makes sense. Leave or enter or expressway. Pull over to the curb. Let's say that there's a fire truck behind you. Gonna pull over so he can get by. Pull over to the side of the road. You got a phone call. It's illegal to be on your phone while you're driving. So you're pulling over to the side of the road to answer the phone. These are what most people forget about. Parking and backing. So that would be backing out of a driveway. This could be backing into a parking spot. This could be um, anything that you want people to know which way your back end is going. And parking, angle parking, perpendicular, parallel parking, we're always going to use our directional. Other situations that may arise um, while you're driving when it comes to turning is what would you do if you found out your car was malfunctioning and your directionals weren't working. You need to know your hand signal. So make sure that everybody knows hand out the window up, making a right hand turn, arm straight out, making a left hand turn, arm out and extended down. You are slowing down or stopping. So stop left, right. If you know those, it's going to help you when you see a bicyclist on the road. Um, or if your directionals don't work. Why would you tap your brakes? Now, when I say tap, I mean the car is slowing down a little bit. So we're not talking about a brake check. We're not talking about, um, you know, tailgaters, although we are going to talk about them in a moment. Um, turning off the highway when there's no deceleration lane. You may want the, because the minute you hit your brakes, the people behind you should be on theirs. That's why you're, you're tapping your brakes is to get them on their brake pedal because the next time you use your brakes, it's going to probably be a little bit more forceful than the first time that you used brakes. Parking, and that's for parallel parking. You always want to tap your brakes before the parking spot you want to take to let people know behind you, hey, don't pull up right behind me because I'm going to be backing into the spot in a moment. If they pull up right behind you, they're going to prevent you from getting into that parallel parking spot. Pothole, debris in the road, something in the road where you want the car behind you to know what you see, but they may not see. I would go tap, tap, and then kind of go around it or straddle it. So uh, they will do the same thing. But I, I should have included here is tapping your brakes is effective for tailgaters. That is something that they, they feel will uh, somewhat get people off your uh, back end. All right, let's talk about following distance. The law states that drivers must not follow another vehicle more closely than is reasonable. I want you to think for a minute, who is going to determine what reasonable is? Okay, reasonable is determined by the police officer. So to make things a little bit more effective for you, so you know what they're looking for, they're looking for a following distance of four seconds now. It used to be two, then it went to three, and now they're saying an adequate following distance to the car in front of you should be around four seconds. So how do you do that? The car in front of you goes by an object. Let's say it's a telephone pole. Once they go past that pole in your head, you're going one, two, three, four. If you get to that pole when you're saying four, you've got your four seconds. If you only get to two, you've got your two seconds. So it's not something that I'm going to have you count out loud with me, but you will hear me at times saying you're getting a little too close. So in your head, I want you to think about, do I have my four seconds? So in your head, you're going one. Two, three, four. You should know that. You should be able to do that. Now, in bad weather um, or following something that where you don't see what they see, like a large truck, if you're following a tractor trailer, I'd go back five to six seconds. I would not want to be too close to that big guy um, because if he hits his brakes and he hits them harder than you hit yours, you're going to have a situation where you're going to run right into the back end of that tractor trailer. Um uh, Smaller cars, you can see what they see. So four seconds is going to be adequate. It's going to be fine. That's all, all that you need. 
Now, here are some questions or some statements that I want you to write down. I would probably write these down and maybe even make them on a, on a cue card so you have an idea of uh, what you should know. Staying back one car length is uh, beneficial if the car in front of you is a manual transmission because people that don't operate the clutch pedal correctly will roll back towards you. So by staying back a car length, it gives them a little bit of comfort knowing that they're not going to be backing right into you. On level ground, this I know, okay, that they will probably mark you off if you do not do this. And I'd say most of you do not. You have to see the tires touching the ground. I mean, rubber on the road. Not just seeing the tires, not just seeing his back bumper, but you want, it's going to translate probably into six or seven feet. Think about it. You're not going to pass the car in front of you to the left or to the right. You're not going to, you know, speed up the minute the light changes or the stop sign. Uh, stay back. Why get so close? I, I don't understand why people feel. Because if the car in front of you breaks down, you want that distance to get around that vehicle if they malfunction. Or if you get hit from behind, you don't want your car to get pushed into the vehicle that's directly in front of you. So it is a safety thing. I know, I know. You're not hitting the car in front of you. We're not talking about that. We're talking about putting you in a situation to handle any situation that arises. If they break down, you're going to have to put it in reverse to back up. That's the only way you're going to get around them if they stall and they can't move the car. So why not stop so you can see the tires on the ground? Then you'll be able to get around. This is a big one. Stay back 10, 15 feet from a crosswalk. I hate... There's not much thing that get me going, but I will have to admit, when you're stopped at a crosswalk and someone's walking in front of you and you take your foot off the brake a little bit and you move up a foot, I just don't get it. You have a pedestrian in front of you. Why are you moving the car forward? Really what you're telling the pedestrian is, hey, I know you're in front of me, but you're going too slow, so you better pick it up. I'm going to move my car right now. That's the way I look at it. Stay stopped until they get off to the right or away from the left of your vehicle. But if they're directly in front of you, do not move the vehicle. The other thing, like we said before, if you get hit from behind, your car is going to go right into that person. It won't be your fault, but the, but the pedestrian is going to be you know, laying on your hood, maybe through your windshield. So if you're staying back 10, 15 feet, you're probably not going to hit the pedestrian, even if you get hit from behind. It, it'd have to be super fast that they're coming up behind to get you. Um, stay back 500 feet from a fire truck. Now, I don't know if I've mentioned this before in this class, but when it comes to the state of New Hampshire, if there's anything that deals with a number and the word fire, okay, so write this down. If there's anything that deals with fire and there's a number that's involved in the answer, it has to have a five in it. That's one thing you'll notice. So 500 feet. Parking from a fire hydrant is 15. So there's a five in that number. So don't get confused with 200, 300, 20. Okay, if it doesn't have a five and it's something to do with fire, that's probably not your answer. So for those of you that are paying attention, that's going to serve you well. Okay, let's talk about tailgaters. We are going to have a section on road rage, and I think uh, road rage uh, tailgating is probably the number one reason where people get uh, angry at someone that's going too slow. You may, you may be going the speed limit or slightly above the speed limit, and people will still be angry at you. I think I had a discussion today with somebody that I was driving with, um, or maybe it was yesterday. You can't please everybody. You can't. All you've got to do is say, I am driving to the best of my ability within what the law states. And we want to be close to the speed limit. You know my philosophy. A little bit above is not going to be huge. And a little bit below is not going to be huge. But we try to be as perfect as we possibly can. We understand because of hills and being unfamiliar with a car that there are going to be some fluctuations. But once it goes above five, you better start thinking about slowing down or coasting, or something to get it closer to what the speed limit is. Now, you still have a tailgater behind you, and you're really kind of annoyed by him. Remember, by flashing your brakes, 
it, two things can happen. That's why I put it up here. The positive, he backs off. He understands. And we're going to use the driver's ed vehicle because we got the sign on top. So he, he understands. He sees the sign. He goes, oh, okay, they're learning to drive. Okay, I'll give him a little bit of extra room. So we serve the purpose of tapping our brakes. But now you're with your mom or your dad. And you're going to speed limit or slightly above. And they're still tailgating you. If you flash your brake lights, this is when they really can get really up close. They may, you look in your rearview mirror, they're banging on their steering wheel. They're flipping you off. They're talking. You know, you got a live wire. You know, you got someone that's going to, you know, go berserk. Maybe you should do one of the following two things. Reduce your speed in a place that they can pass you safely. So move to the right. Go a little bit slower. It's a straightaway. Let them go by. If it's a hill or a curve and it's not too safe, you probably should pull over and let them go. Just get them, get them away from you. Okay. Good riddance. See you later. We'll probably see you at the next stop sign or the next traffic light. On the same lines of what we talked about at the beginning of this section, about 20 to 30 seconds, um, that is what we're looking ahead. Let's add some other time frames and what should be going through your head. So I want you to add this to your notes. I want you to write down within 15 seconds, you should have a visual lead of what your potential problems are. Okay, let me give you an example. You're going down a straightaway and you see a traffic light a quarter of a mile up the road. Up on the right, you see a bicyclist. To the left, you see a dog that is loose and probably up about 100 feet, you've got a pothole. So you got three things that are crossing your mind. Within those 15 seconds, okay, you've got to start to formulate the next bullet, your response time. What are you going to do with those three things? Okay, so let's take it problem by problem. The first one's a pothole. We're going to straddle it. Keep our speed. Good. Things were fine. Okay, next person or next problem is the bicyclist. Now we're going to slow down a little bit. And we're going to go left of center. We're going to give him a little bit extra room over there on the right. But wait a minute, here comes the dog. Looks like it's getting too close to the road. I'm going to go slower and I'm going to go to the far right away from where the dog is coming from. If the dog is coming from the left, I want to get as far away from where he could be coming towards me because that's going to give me more time to think about whether I want to slow down more or speed up. If you stay too close to the yellow line, he's going to come out on the road and it's going to be less time, less distance. Then it's going to be a little bit hard to handle. Um, it should be following distance should be four seconds here. It's not three. This was back when it used to be three and then less than three seconds is if you don't handle it correctly, you got three seconds to fix it because anything less than three seconds, you're probably going to get hit or you're going to hit somebody. All right. So 15 seconds is looking for your problems. Five to 15 is how you're going to respond to those situations. Four seconds is your following distance. In less than three seconds is your crash zone, all right? So those are the intervals that I want you to be familiar with. This is the one thing that I will not teach you. This is not something I'm going to take you out on the road one day and, and I'm going to pick on somebody. I'm going to pick on Sonia. It's not like I'm going to say, okay, Sonia, today we're going to drive until we pass somebody. It's just not going to happen, okay? I'm going to teach you lane changes and we're going to be on the highway if a situation arises where we can pass legally, I will have you pass. But it's not something that we're going to be looking for. All right. It does need extra skill. Uh, you have to know speed and distance of your car and their car uh, to make this work. And at nighttime, it does get a little bit more complicated, especially on a single lane road going in opposite directions. That's when it really gets complicated. Like on Route 155, there are some passing zones. Passing on the highway is just like a lane change. It's pretty simple. Um, and we could do it there if we wanted to. Uh, just realize that to, to pass somebody, I would probably write down 10 to 20 seconds. You And remember, you do want to go faster than the car that you're passing. We're going to talk about highway driving. So this is going to come up again in week four. Um, if there's any doubt, don't do it. If you're really nervous about it, you probably should wait for another time. Second thing you should do is check your passing lane. So that means you're looking, um, 
what's in front of you. Is the car coming faster than you anticipated? Then you're checking your blind spot, you're signaling, and then you're moving over into oncoming traffic, keeping your speed. Now, when I say keep your speed, I put down in your notes, if you're writing this down, I would go 10 miles faster than the car I'm passing. Anything less than 10 faster than what they're doing is going to probably take you too long. The, the, the sooner you pass the person, the better off you're going to be. So try to make it as quick as possible. Now, I'm not saying, okay, make it quick. So go, you know, 30 over the speed limit. That's kind of ridiculous. Um, and technically, by law, the way it's written in the books is you're not supposed to go over the speed limit to pass somebody. But how many times have you been on the highway where it's 55 and people pass you like you're standing still? Everybody's passing above the speed limit. But the way it's written on the books is you're not supposed to go above the speed limit to pass somebody. So they have to be going slower. Uh, when to get back to your original lane is when you can see uh, the person that you've just passed in your um, rear view mirror and see both headlights. So when you can see both uh, headlights, then you're, you're good to go. So signal before moving back to your lane, and then you have to get back within 200 feet. Anything that deals with footage, I would write down, okay? So write down anything that has numbers. So 200 feet with an oncoming car, and you're getting back into your lane. Situations where you can pass. Um, if there's not enough pavement to allow to pass, um, you shouldn't do it on the right. Uh, if someone's turning left, you can pass. One-way streets, multi-lane highways, all legal situations to pass another car. Where is passing not allowed? Unless the left lane of the road uh, is clear, crest of a hill, curve. Uh, now some footage questions. You're just going to have to plain, uh, you know, write it out and remember it. So both of them are 100 feet. So viaduct, bridge, or tunnel, and then 100 feet of an intersection of railroad crossing. So you really need quite a distance. So that's a third of a football field. 100 feet is what we talked about with um, putting our signal on. So the distance between two telephone poles. So that's, that's not much room. You got to get back in. And remember, look for your no passing zones. That's the pennant shape sign that's on the left side of the road indicating that you should not be passing. And remember, the no, um, the no passing zone sign is on the left because if you pass a car, you need to see the sign uh, telling you that you're coming to the solid yellow line. And where the solid yellow line and the no passing zone sign is, they're at the same point. So it's, that's kind of good to know. In case you can't see the solid line, you'll always have the sign to remind you. Uh, what lane should you be in? Two lanes. Um, be in the right side for normal driving, slow moving. Left side's left for passing. Multiple lanes. Right side is for slow. Middle's for smoothest. So I always like being in the uh, middle if we go to Portsmouth. And then left for high speed and passing. Now, in Massachusetts, it's illegal to drive in the left lane continuously. You've got to use it only for passing. It's not to stay in that lane and just hang there and, and go fast. You've got to get back uh, to the right of the uh, left lane. Um, I will test you on this. This is usually our fourth uh, time out driving. There are four steps to a lane change. And the, the state uses the uh, acrostic of smog. Uh, signal, mirrors, over the shoulder check, and then go. So I just wrote it out a little bit more precisely. Use your directionals first because no one knows you want to make a lane change. So put your signal on. Let people know you want to move to the right. Then check your rear view mirror first. Then your right side mirror when you're making a lane change to the right. Then you're looking just off to the right of your shoulder to see if there's anybody lingering in your blind spot. And lastly, when you move to the lane, you should, from the checks that you've taken, you should know, should I maintain speed, should I increase speed, or should I slow down? But it's based upon those checks. And we'll definitely uh, review lane changes before I let you go because the state um, is going to probably require one for your driver's license. That takes us to the end of turning. Now, the next section, which I'm going to go over fairly quickly, because it's not a very big chapter, is stopping. Um, and we're talking about stopping at different distances, okay? I will tell you right now, and you can write this down in your notes, everybody thinks the car can stop a lot quicker 
than it actually can. I'm going to show you a video, which is a commercial, and it, it was probably about 20, 30 years ago, but I still like it. The re reason why I can tell it's so old is that the car doesn't have anti-lock brakes. It has um, conventional brakes, and you can see the tires still moving a little bit. But I, I want to pose this question to you, okay? A car that's going, let me give you a speed, um, 40 miles per hour. All right. So during the video, 40 miles per hour. Um, I want you to write down in the YouTube comments here at 40 miles per hour from the time that you see something to the time that you stop, how far does your car travel? All right. So let me show you the, the video and then you can write down your answer. All right. At 40 miles per hour, how long is it going to take you? How many feet to stop a vehicle? Just five miles per hour over the 30 miles per hour speed limit. How much further will it take to stop? One foot, two feet, three feet, four feet, five feet, six feet, seven feet, eight feet, nine feet, ten feet, eleven feet, twelve feet, thirteen feet, fourteen feet, fifteen feet. 16 feet, 17 feet, 18 feet, 19 feet, 20 feet. Twenty one feet. When somebody comes out in front of you, you really don't have a lot of time to stop. And it, this is that threshold breaking that is the emergency, you, you know, hitting the pedal as hard as you can and just praying, I hope I don't hit this person. This is why we went through the time frames of looking way up the road and have a basic understanding of what's happening in front of you. Because your car is mechanical and it can only do what it is intended to do within certain limits. But you're part of the equation. You're the first part of the equation. We're going to talk about that in a moment. So um, no one's answering the question at 40 miles per hour. How long does it take to stop a vehicle? Come on, put it put it in the YouTube section here. I'm going to show you another um, uh, short clip about um, dropping your speed. When you're in a bad situation like a city or where there's a lot of people, uh, go slow. Go slower than speed limit. Don't feel like you always have to go fast. So here's on a highway where they're only dropping their speed probably by about five, seven, eight miles per hour. But look at the dis uh, difference in their stopping distance. What you're about to see will change your mind about speeding. Two identical cars, one traveling at 60, the other at 65. A sudden change in the road ahead. And both drivers first react and then a moment later, they break. And things start to get interesting. Down here, the difference is extraordinary. In the last five metres of braking, you wipe off half your speed. So this car is still doing 32 k's when it hits. This one also hits, but only at five k's. So no matter how good a driver you are, 5 k's difference up there makes 27 k's difference down here. I think everybody thought I was looking for what you saw in the first video clip in town. of How many feet did that car need to stop? That's not the question. The question was at 40 miles per hour. Okay, that car was not going 40 miles per hour. Um... 
even I'm looking at the answers right now. Uh, ben says 75 feet for 40 miles per hour. And you know how I told you at the beginning, just a few moments ago, that none of you really truly have a basic understanding of stopping distance? The correct answer is 147 feet. From the time that you see something to the time that you bring your car to a stop at 40 miles per hour, your car has traveled 150 feet. This is why people follow too closely, because they think my car can stop on a dime. No, it can't. We do not have that capability. On a highway going 60 miles per hour, just a little bit above the speed limit of 55, you're going the distance of a football field. Think about that. That's a long distance to, to, in order to stop. So even when road and vehicle conditions are ideal and the driver is perfectly alert, it takes a great distance to stop a motor vehicle through the use of good judgment and knowledge of stopping distance, and that's what we want to gain from this little PowerPoint tonight, is to get some knowledge about stopping distance, we will reduce our chance of being involved in a crash. But we have to think about it every time that we get behind somebody and we think about our following distance, we have to think about, okay, I'm going 30, I'm going 40, I'm going 50. What's my stopping distance? How far back should I be? Remember, more distance is better. So let's kind of t think about the process of stopping. As we said from the get-go tonight, vision and judgment is so important. So the first thing is you must see and recognize the danger or the need to stop. Remember the section that we had on inattention blindness? You're going to find this hard to believe, but some of you in this class have run a stop sign with me. The stop sign was not hidden behind a bush. It was not hidden behind a vehicle. It was in plain sight and you weren't going to stop and I had to. So you have to see it because if you don't see it, you won't, you won't stop. So it could be inattention, why you're missing things. It could be you're tired. It could be, uh, now I'm not talking about you specifically. I'm talking general population now, but um, people, and I forgot, I think I was driving with Karsten. We actually saw a person in a parking lot today, uh, go to his trunk and get a can of beer and bring it to the front seat with him. And he drove away and I'm sure he wasn't bringing it to the front seat to just to keep it uh, safe and warm and protected. I'm sure he was going to crack it open and probably consume it while he was driving. So someone under the influence of alcohol or drugs, their reactions are going to be slower. They may not see the need to stop. Now, the brain has to then tell your foot to stop on the brake pedal. Now, if you're under the influence or you're fatigued, you may think that you need to brake, but you may not be thinking the correct amount. So you still might hit a person. You may be on the brakes, but you're not using the right amount of brake pedal to uh, stop your car. And then lastly, as we said, you got to use it correctly. Um, I'm not going to show you this. Okay, I want you to write down reaction time, reaction distance. I am going to test you on one of these definitions. So we have two of them. Remember, I told you that braking is broken down into two realms. The first realm is the human realm. This is where you're the main component to stopping. And that's where you're seeing something and knowing that there's a need to stop. So from the time, from the moment that you see a danger until you step on your brake is called reaction time. Now, what we have found for every 10 miles per hour, you're going 11 feet, All right? So I want you to think about that. For every 10 miles per hour, from the time that you see it to you move from the gas to the brake, you're probably going up 10 feet, 10 or 11 feet. The distance your vehicle has traveled during uh, this period is called reaction distance. And the average driver takes about three quarters of a second to get from the gas to the brake. Here's a question for you. You're in the driver's ed vehicle and we're going down the road and we have a traffic light and the light is green and then all of a sudden it turns yellow. How many of you want to make a bet that I can get to my brake before you get to yours? Think about that. The light changes. Who's going to get to the brake first? Is it going to be me 
uh, I'm talking about you, the teenager that's 16, 17, 18 years old, or the old guy next to me that's going to be 60 this summer? Is the old man going to get to the break before the teenager? I'll probably eight out of the 10 times get to the break before you do. Because I'm anticipating. I know when lights are changing. I have a sense. You're still learning to drive. Don't feel so overconfident in your driving skill, in your youth, and think that you can overcompensate for getting to the brake late and you'll be able to brake. It doesn't happen that way. So I'll probably get to my brake before you do. All right, the second component is your vehicle. So braking time is the time it takes from the brakes and the friction between the road and the tires to stop your vehicle. Braking distance is the distance your vehicle travels during this time. So we have braking, uh, we have reaction time and reaction distance, and now we have braking time and braking distance. That's why we have to total it up. So when I told you it was probably close to 150 feet when you're going 40 miles per hour, most of you are probably thinking, you've got to be crazy. There's no way I can stop a car going 40 miles per hour. You're probably not thinking about the um, reaction distance and time. You're probably only thinking about when the tires are starting to slow the vehicle down and then coming to a stop. And even then, even then, it does go quite a distance. Now, what are some of the factors that go into stopping a car? Definitely the road surface. Anything that's level, flat, great pavement, you're going to stop quicker. Cracks, bumps, potholes will create problems for your suspension and for your car to really grip and hold on a roadway. Your brakes, this is why we have vehicle inspections to make sure your car's in good um, working order. Weather, snow, sleet, rain, things like that. And we've talked about fatigue, alcohol, drugs, stuff like that. All those will be factors in um, stopping a car. But probably the number one, and what I want you to write down is tires, okay? So write down tires. I'm going to show you a quick commercial from Toyota about tires. We tested the effect worn tires have on stopping distance. 60 miles per hour on a wet road. Three sets of tires, each with different tread depths. And one professional driver. When the driver accelerated to 60 miles per hour, watch what happened when he tried to stop. While your actual distances may vary, it took him nearly 10 additional car lengths to stop on worn tires. So, when will you stop? Ask about our complimentary tire inspections. So that takes care of the section on stopping. Now for one of my favorite topics when it deals uh, with teaching young drivers is the topic of speed, okay, speed limits. Uh, we know that speed limits are on the side of the road to uh, maintain um, a good flow of traffic for people to get to where they're going and to do it safely. But we also know that people don't always know what the speed limit is. So how can we look at an area and really figure it out what the speed limit is and what happens if I go too fast or too slow. And we'll also talk a little bit about what happens the day that you do get pulled over and you get stopped. But the first thing I want to start off with is to let you understand that as a driver, you're responsible for everybody inside your vehicle. Okay, the minute you get in the car to drive and you let your two best friends in the in the car, you're responsible for their life. I mean, I don't want to overstate it. Your carelessness, uh, your fooling around could have a, a, a grave impact on their quality of life. I know we hear the term, I'm sorry. And when something goes wrong, I believe it should be said. But remember, you can't undo some negative things in life. So let's just try to think about not getting ourselves into those situations where we have to uh, beg for mercy and beg for forgiveness. And I find that a lot of teen drivers, uh, besides being distracted where you shouldn't have the phone or other things in the car that are going to make you less than the best driver that you can be. I find that 
young drivers think speed's not that big of a deal. As long as nobody's around, nobody's looking, I don't think there's any police around, let's see what this car can do. And you go a lot faster. And I'm not talking just five over the speed limit. I'm talking 20, 30, 40 miles per hour. Let me see. We've got only one person's not here. I don't know who, who it is. I'll have to take a look at the list. But we almost have a full class. Out of 23 people, I'm going to guess, and you don't have to write this on YouTube so people won't be able to see this, but I am almost betting that a good majority of you have been in a car at speeds of 90, 100 miles per hour. But guess what? There's not a speed limit around this area that's 90 or 100, but yet you've been in a vehicle going that fast. So the question I have for you, and I want you to answer this on yourself, uh, to yourself, is that did you feel comfortable and did you ever think about what would happen if a deer came out, if there was a mechanical problem with the car, um, they hit a pothole. Did you think about what could happen? Pretty soon you're going to be the driver now. When you were going 100 miles per hour, I don't think any of you were probably driving. You were a passenger. So it begs the question, is what was the driver thinking about? Did the driver make sure everybody had their seatbelt on? Okay, Going that fast, it doesn't take that much for something to go wrong. All right, There aren't roads really around here maybe 95 could is built for that but even the spalding i wouldn't the, the exits are too close together and stuff i would say we don't have roads built for those kind of speeds there are places in the world like the autobahn where you can go fast i want to show you a little clip and and a lot of people ask me how how can you teach young people to drive doesn't it just freak you out aren't you nervous all the time not really. I mean, I've been doing this a long time. Do I get nervous? Sure. You know, when I think that you don't quite have control, how much do I have to let you figure it out on your own? Uh, when do I have to step in and, um, you know, I, I have to kind of let you learn through the process. But yeah, I get a little bit nervous. Now, this is one of my favorite videos when it comes to speed because it gives a sense. Well, I'll just say watch it first and then we'll talk about it. Oh, wow. Yeah. Nice and easy. Just head on out whenever you're ready. Are you ready to go ahead and, yeah. and drive? Okay. Yeah, sure. Oh, whoa. <laughs> That's all right. Oh, a little more than I'm used to. Yeah. Oh, no. It's got some power, so just get a feel for it. Okay. Okay. All right. But ease off just a little bit. Ease off. So I was thinking a lot more age on me, some wrinkles, a little dorky, maybe some facial hair. And just somebody that I can pull off a, a fun prank with. <laughs> Let's, Let's go have some fun. My good friends at Pepsi Max have hooked us up with this cool cam cam. So these are the glasses cam to show you everything that I see. How you doing? Hello. I'm Mike. Steve, nice to meet you, Mike. So you sort of gravitated towards the Camaro. You thinking about getting one? Oh no, no, no. This this way too much car for me. I'm well. It's a lot of power, but they've designed it to be very safe. I don't know if I can handle it. I, I've never driven anything like this before. Well, I, I tell you what. I think a way to really make you feel comfortable would be to put you behind the wheel. You're good. <laughs> what are you driving now? Oh, just a minivan. Oh yeah. Yeah, what am I not signing obligated. here? You're you're not, sure? it's, it's just a checkout sheet for a test drive. You're not obligated to anything. It's just so we know who's out. Let's go give it a drive. Ready I'm getting a little nervous. No, I'll be right there beside you. There are your keys, sir. Thank you, Steve. You'll have to unlock it, Mike. Oh, yeah. thank you. Okay. There we go. Oh, yeah. What a car. Mm -hmm. Well, we better buckle up. Yeah, good call. Power. Power door locks. Standard, of course. You are liable for any damages to the vehicle, so please stop the car. Slow, or at least slow down. Slow down. Slow down. You can't go through that gate, Mike. Stop! 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 Watch out! 
you're gonna wreck this car, and you're liable for it if you wreck it. Mike, stop the car! Stop the car right now! Here's a camera, there's cameras. Look, it was all just fun. Look, I'm Jeff Gordon. <laughs> Sorry, man. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> Can we do it again? Yeah. <laughs> I kind of like his comment at the very end. Do you want to do it again? I mean, in a, in a heartbeat, his attitude changed because then he knew. The person was in complete control. It was a setup. It was a prank. But when you're out with your friends and they're driving really fast and they're laughing, you're probably more like the guy, you know, going down the road and passing someone on the right and going up. You're not that comfortable. You're thinking at any moment, my friend is going to crash this car and we're going to be in a lot of trouble. Okay. You've got to speak up. Okay. Your life has value. The driver should respect the way that you feel. All right. Now they may make fun of you. They may say, you know, you're, you know, a wimp or this or whatever. But um, it's better than him to get into trouble with either with the police or having a crash. Um, I was at a conference and it, someone said, you know, this there are two ways that you can always guarantee to slow down the driver. And I thought about it. And I says, you know, this is kind of a a, a shrewd way of of making someone slow down. If you were to fake getting sick, if you were to tell the driver that, you know, you're going to throw in a moment, I will guarantee you he doesn't want it in his car. So he's going to slow down and he's going to open up the door and you'll be able to get out and maybe walk or fake getting sick. Uh, or say that you have to go to the bathroom really, really, really bad. I mean, you got to go. They'll pull over. All right. So uh, that might be a way to change their behavior momentarily. So let's talk about speed and what is the safest speed. So we just saw Jeff Gordon. So who's in control? Um, the driver is. He's the one with the accelerator. He's the one with the steering wheel. Um, he's the one in control. So what is considered a safe speed? And this is the way the state looks at it. Is a speed that allows you to have complete control of the vehicle, making right turns, left turns, Stopping at your stop lines, that's a safe speed. Then you've got to think about, could you be going the speed limit and then have a blowout and not be in control? Sure. So when you're driving, you think something bad's going to happen. Drop your speed so you can control what's going to happen to the car in a bad situation. Just like with braking, uh, braking and stopping and speed are whatever affects one will affect the other. So road surface, brakes, tires, weather, all these things come into play with the movement of the vehicle. Uh, also heavy traffic, okay? You don't wanna be riding on someone's back end all the time, so you know, stay back that four seconds. Uh, the safest speed is the average speed. Now, I know we're gonna have a debate probably with parents and with other people, other officials, but we know it's the it's the the rule of um, flow of traffic, because traffic moving in the same direction at the same speed will not crash into one another. Uh, problems happen when we have people going too slow, too fast. So my suggestion to you, if you're on a multi-lane highway, is to stay to a middle lane, find a pocket where you've got your four seconds in front of you, you got good distance in your rear view mirror, and just hang. Does that mean that you're going 55? You might be going 61. You know, you could be going 62, but you got your following distance. No one's really close. It's a nice day. 
you're in great shape, you know, you're, everything is good, you're probably not going to have any issues with the police or with your surroundings. But when we start introducing more traffic, the weather, you're not feeling well, you know, be safe, be safe and go at a uh, speed that's appropriate for what is going on around you. Uh, remember that these speed limits have been set by traffic engineers and officials. Will we find speed limits change? Yes, we do. Um, very rarely do we see speed limits go slower. I've noticed that for the majority of changes I've seen, they've always bumped them up by five or 10 miles per hour. Like on the Spalding Turnpike, it used to be 55 up around Rochester and it's now 65. And the state wants you to remember, that's why I've got it up here, it limits our maximums. So even though I told you to go with the flow of traffic, it is still written in the law by the book that if it says 55, it's 55. If it says 30, it's 30. Okay, they, they want you to look at it as black and white. It's kind of ironic because I think most of our life we live in the gray area. We kind of blend what's right, what's wrong, and we kind of make the best of situations. So got to tell you, obey the law and you'll never have, that's why I tell my son, if you obey the law, you'll never get in trouble. So how are they going to know that I'm doing it wrong? That's another good question, right? The police are on the side of the road. You know, we know that they've got technology, but what is the technology that's out there that are going to monitor your speed? So I want you to write down in your notes. In New Hampshire, they have radar, they have laser, they have aircraft to monitor speed. Yes, they can actually use helicopters and planes on major routes. So they don't do it on your minor um, state routes. It has to be a major route like 95, 93, 89, 101, Spalding. If it's a major highway with off ramps, they can monitor you by aircraft and they time you from one point. They, they have, if you ever look to the breakdown lane, there are little white strips and they will time you from strip to strip. And what they'll do is they'll radio down below and they'll say, OK, there is a, uh, a red, you know, um, you know, Toyota truck that uh, we've got clocked. He's probably going about 66 and a 55. And you're driving that truck and all of a sudden, you know, two miles up the road, there's an officer outside of his cruiser with his lights on and he's pointing at you and he's saying, pull over to the side of the road. And you're thinking, whoa, whoa, whoa what did I do? You're thinking, what did I do wrong? And little did you know that they've already uh, radioed down below and told the officer uh, which vehicle to pull over. And sometimes um, with these binoculars and stuff, they can actually run your license plate. So when the officer uh, comes to your car or comes to your truck, they call you by your first name because they know who the vehicle is registered to. So if it sees that it's a male, they'll probably assume, you know, you're the, the person driving it is the one that is registered it to. So they'll call you by your name. I've heard a few stories like that. And it just freaks people up that how do they know that? Well, that's why. Now, this is in, um, I believe, Australia. I thought it was kind of interesting. Police cruisers, uh, police motorcycles that have radar in their binoculars. Watch this. It's kind of cool. If you reckon you can get away with speeding, look at this. Police radars are more sophisticated than ever. He's about a kilometre away, this fella. Watch this. Got him. He had no idea. Here you go. Just slow down. It's not worth it. Over 200 cars with these radars are out day and night. And back in town, the new ProLight lasers can pinpoint a speeding driver in busy traffic and catch him. It's just not worth speeding because we'll catch you before someone gets hurt. So I thought that was um, uh, pretty interesting. Uh, let's take a look what it is like here in the United States with radar. And they're going to talk about laser and radar. Now, remember, laser is a little bit more accurate. It's a little bit more pinpoint. So technology, is, of course, is always changing. And that's the other thing I want you to think about. Even though you've probably heard of radar detectors inside of people's cars, I believe it gives you a false sense of security because what the only reason you would ever buy a radar detector is because you want to be going so fast that you don't want to be bothered by getting a ticket and getting stopped by the police. So I want to break the law. I want to do what I want to do. And I just don't want to get in trouble for it. Now, 
police know what's out there for technology. So they're looking one way to circumvent your radar detector. And the only time that your radar detector is going to sense that there's a police officer out on the roadways if he's left his radar detector on. So he's got his gun pointing to you. So a smart police officer will wait till he gets eye contact and they can basically tell just by looking at vehicles approaching whether they're going too fast or not. So he's waiting till you get into the line of sight. He says, oh, this car looks a little bit fast. So then they're going to flip on their radar or laser. And now they've locked you in. Now inside your car, your radar detector is going crazy. The lights are flashing. The noise is being made. But by then, he's got you locked in and now you got a ticket. So you paid $200 for the radar detector. And now you got a $200 speeding ticket and your insurance are going up. So to me, it's just not worth it. So let's take a look at uh, how they use the uh, gun here in the United States. Hi, I'm Bo Babkin. We're coming to you from the Cottonwood Heights Police Department in Utah. The next question is, how does a radar gun work or how does radar work? There's two different types of radar in, in our world right now, and there's many, there are others, but the two I'll talk about is, one is, is regular radar, which we call, which is a frequency-based type of radar, and then we have LIDAR, which is laser, which is a, uh, the acuity of a laser uh, radar gun is pretty close to being perfect. I mean, you can, from many, many hundreds of feet, you can put a, a laser on the, the, the front of a license plate and measure uh, how fast somebody's going, as opposed to the other one I talked about briefly before, and that's the, that's the regular radar or the frequency radar where it sends out a, a frequency and it, it calculates how fast somebody's going. Sometimes, uh, some t or most of the time, an officer will be standing stationary, and that machine will measure the speed of a vehicle and how fast it's going. Um, there are other situations where we can measure the speed of a vehicle as well when um, a, a patrol car or a police car is going in one direction and a car is coming in the other direction. Uh, that machine that's being used is, is measuring the speed of the actual vehicle that's going to measure it and measuring the speed of the vehicle coming towards. So it's, a, it's really a, quite a machine, and I know it, we don't have enough time to really explain all of it, but I know they, they work very well, one on frequency, one on laser beam, if you will. So I thought that was interesting. They could point it out the back window, side window, front. Uh, it's multi-directional. It can... Um it can get you so this will be on the midterm so i want you to know in new hampshire um school zones are 10 miles below this posted speed limit 45 minutes before school opens and 45 minutes after school closes so during the day by saint thomas it's not 30 it's 40 okay um mast way and more hermit the lights are flashing most of the time now because of kids coming to school at different intervals so if you see the flashing light that flashing light indicates it's a time they want you to go slower but if it was a regular school year it's only 45 minutes before and 45 minutes after and, and around mast way i mean um Mohammed, they actually have it posted right on the sign the time the time frame so you know that uh city or urban so urban city, that means the same thing is maximum is 30. Durham is 25 around the campus area. Downtown Portsmouth sections are around 20. So we will find slower speeds, but the fastest in a city will be 30. Country areas, rural roads will have a, this is the widest range from 35 to about 50. So, you know, if we've gone the route from Mast Way into Dover, we go from a, 40 then it goes to a 35 then it goes to a 50 and then back into dover where we hit a, a 30 zone so it's really good to you know test your ability and now with technology with gps it actually tells us the speed that we're traveling you know on the on the map so even though you missed the last sign a lot of times it's giving you that information a highway minimum of 45, maximum of 65. Could go even higher, I believe, up around the Plymouth area. 
up in the northern part of New Hampshire. I think it can go up to uh, 70 now. Uh, house trailers, which are being the wide uh, modular homes where they're uh, bringing people um, their home by tractor trailer, they can only go 45. So this gives you a, a rough estimate of, of speeds. So throughout the country, they can post whatever they want. So here we see 85. So it says seven states, Idaho, Montana, Nevada, South Dakota, Texas, Utah, Wyoming, I have allowed 80 mile per hour speed limits. And I believe actually Maine should be included there. I think you can go that fast up in Maine. Uh, and Texas has an uh, 85 on State Highway 130. So this is totally up to the state to set the speed limit. Okay, so there is no federal mandate. It's all up to the states. And once we build roads, and we talked about the HTS and making roads safer, cars are built to go fast. If the skill of the driver is up to it, you can safely drive at these speeds as long as the, way, the lane width is wide enough and uh, the road is built uh, well enough so we don't have cracks and potholes and things like, or drainage problems, yeah. And most of the states that we have listed up here aren't really affected by um, heavy snow. Um, work zones, okay, we're coming into the summer months. Um, let me just show you the, um, oh, the, uh, the, the, um, speed limit in a construction zone's got to be slow. All right. So, uh, cut your speed in half. I believe it's a, like a 250 to $500 fine. So here's, um, something on work zones. <laughs> They can become a common sight across Missouri when the weather is warm, construction zones. These men and women are out working right along the highway trying to give you a safer and smoother ride. And we want to remind you to be alert. Trooper Green with the Highway Patrol. That's why we decided to join a state trooper. The speed limit in this construction area is 60. As he works to ensure you drive safe and obey the speed limits in a work zone. Rear, stationary. Is that good enough for you? The reason I'm stopping you is going a little fast this morning. Do you have your driver's license and your insurance with you? Oftentimes, there's a lot of construction projects going on around the roadways in different parts of the, the city and the county. And they don't realize that these individuals are out here basically risking their lives trying to improve the roadways. The Missouri Department of Transportation and the Highway Patrol work together to cut down on the number of accidents involved in a work zone. So I need you to pay a little bit more attention, okay? There's a lot of guys doing road construction up through here and that's why we're out here is trying to prevent one of these accidents from one of these individuals getting run over and obviously you can understand why, all right? That's why every year MoDOT sets aside a week in the month of April for Work Zone Awareness Week. For our workers, this is their office. This is where they work every day. And so people need to be aware of that. They're trying to get a job done. You know, if you were going 60 and had to stop for some reason or slow down for something ahead, you're able to do so. Come along at 80 miles an hour, you don't stop in time. And unfortunately, you end up striking a, uh, an individual out here working, doing his job. So remember, if you're out driving this construction season, be on the lookout for those orange cones, obey the speed limit, and stay alert out there. You could be saving somebody's life. All right, have a good day. Or maybe even your own. So it's important to follow the direction of the flag person. Uh, stay away from the cone, stay as far away from the construction workers as you possibly can. And you really can't go too slow. They're more concerned about people that um, are going faster than they should because construction workers don't always pay attention. High speed driving, if you drive faster than prevailing traffic, you will have to continue to pass other cars. This is why you're building a bad habit. So each time you pass, there's more of a chance and risk of having a crash. And when you double your speed, your stopping distance will sometimes be four times greater. So it's much easier to stop a car going 20 than it is a car going 40. Serious injury or death is four times greater at 60 than at 30. And you waste fuel and increase wear and tear on your tires. That may not be a concern to you because you're driving your parents' car. But one of these days, 
you're going to be the one flipping the bill. And of course, you're going to always be tailgating people. The slower driver is sometimes just as bad as the fast driver. They're going to make other cars take risk like tailgating and going around them when they shouldn't. So remember, if you can't keep up with the speed limit, you probably should pull over to the right and let other people get by. Uh, so allow people to pass. Don't feel like, you know, it's my section of the road. And if I want to go 10 miles below the speed limit, I'm going to do it. Um, that's no attitude to take. And I think a lot of older people, rather than give up their license, they think, oh, I'll just drive extra slow and I'm going to be fine. Mm, that's not the case. They're going to have issues. Let's just talk for a brief moment about being pulled over by the police. It's going to happen. I would almost guarantee at some point in everybody's life, you're going to get pulled over. Um, there are three things that could happen. The first thing is that they just give you a verbal warning. You know, um, did you know, Mr. Jones, that uh, you're going, you know, eight over the speed limit? This is a 30 or going 38. Oh, I didn't know it was a 30. Well, you know, you really should pay attention to your signs. We don't want anything to happen to you. And it's basically have a good day. And they give your license registration back to you. And off you go. The second thing they could do, it maybe it's a teenager. You're going 13 over the speed limit. And they look at your license. They go, you've only had your license for two months. You're fresh out of driver's ed. And you don't know what the speed limit in this area is. And you live here. Okay, this is not good. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write you up. And if I catch you speeding again, this is going to actually go into effect and I'm going to write you up for the new ticket too. So they basically suspend it. It's kind of what they call a written warning. So they give it to you. It's a piece of paper. They put it in the computer system so they know if they pick you up again, you know, in the next couple of weeks or a month that uh, you're going to get basically, you know, two tickets. One for the one that they kind of let you off on and now because you're doing it again. Uh or they could just plain give you a ticket. That's the third thing. No warning, no verbal, no written. You're two months out of driver's ed. You should know better. Shame on you. You're getting a ticket. And remember, you're going to lose your license for 20 days on your first moving violation. So you just lost your license for 20 days. So let's talk about, I don't have any of these movie, movie clips. So I should have probably put them in. Okay, let's talk about the steps that you should take. First of all, pull well off the road. Find a place that is safe for you and safe for the officer. There's nothing that's going to make an officer more upset as he walks to your vehicle if he has to walk out into traffic in an unsafe area. You could still drive a mile, two miles down the road till you know that there's a parking lot or something. Just go slow. Put your right directional on and just stay off to the right and just drive to where you think is safe, not only for him, but for you. Second thing, stay calm. You have no idea why he's pulling you over. Maybe, maybe you do know why he's pulling you over. Now you do have a reason to be nervous. Never, ever get out of your vehicle. I will guarantee you, you get out of the vehicle, they're going to probably uh, pull a gun on you because uh, they're trained that way. Okay, it, the, the, the most dangerous place for a police officer is making a road stop. I know we've got a bad situation right now in uh, Minneapolis and I feel bad for the family and I feel bad for the police officer, but there are so many things that went wrong and that, that stop and it could have had a different outcome if people would have just thought of what we're talking about right now. Okay. Cause we, we, things escalate because that's how people have been trained or they escalate because people are so afraid of what the police are going to do. There has to be more trust. So stay in the vehicle. Keep your hands on the steering wheel. Make sure that they're visible. When they ask for your license and your registration, give it to them. I wouldn't be searching for it until they tell me. They may not even ask for it. Maybe they'll just take a look at you and say, you know what? You got a, a, a light out in the back of your vehicle. You should probably get that fixed because people can't see your right brake light. And you're going, wow, I thought I was going to get pulled over for speeding just because I have a light out. That's great. Okay, so don't do anything foolish. Now, if they're giving you a ticket, that's their job. You did something wrong. No one wants to be punished. No one wants to pay a fine, see their insurance go up. 
don't lie, cry, make excuses, because you could probably make the situation worse. Remember, it is a ticket. You can still go to court to fight it. You have your day to explain why you think it was unjust. It was unfair. But when you start doing things and, you know, making fun of the police officer because of what they look like or what their job profession is, or if you say, you know, my dad knows the mayor or whatever, you know, your dad's connected, they're not going to look too kindly on that because you're making them seem like they're insignificant. And that could really go wrong. So. He'll give you the ticket. He'll tell you how to handle it. You have your day in court. He'll probably uh, let you go first. So put your directional on, go down the road, and I'll guarantee you'll drive differently for the next couple of days. Uh, it puts the fear of God in you, too, when you see the blue lights come on. And like I said, a lot of people ask me, have we been pulled over in the driver's ed car? Yeah, we have, for going too fast and for having a brake light or a tail light out. So they're they're there to... You know, make sure that we're doing the right thing too. And as you know, you're learning to drive. So do you make mistakes? Absolutely. Do you drive too fast with me? Sometimes you do. And sometimes when they look at it, they're not upset at you going too fast. If you get pulled over in the driver's ed car, they're more angry at me than they are at you. It's my job to make sure that you're doing what is right, that I'm training you the correct way. So um, it happens. And for the most part, um, they're pretty good. I, I think for the most part, police officers are trying hard to do a good job, and I think that they are. But there's always some that take their job a little bit too seriously or aren't trained uh, well enough, and, and we have some bad outcomes. But I believe if we uh, do what we're supposed to, we can uh, make this situation, um, you know, come out to our benefit where nothing real bad happens. I do have a video that I want to show, but it's not going to be tonight. We're probably going to do it tomorrow. Uh, so what we're going to do, so let's talk about the midterm. Everything that we've covered up to this point is fair game for the midterm. It is going to be heavy, heavy, heavy on sign signals and payment markings. Not quite like the sign quiz that I gave you last week, um, but kind of like it. Okay, it will all be multiple choice. Uh, every single uh, class that we've had or every section that you've had to read will have uh, at least a question or something related to it. Uh, in the midterm. I think it's around 70 questions, 75 questions, something like that. So we're going to start off tomorrow's class talking about parking. And then I'm going to show the video on speed. It's a um, video that was made probably about 10 years ago. And I have a reaction paper that um, I want you to do after the midterm. You'll have to think back to the video. Actually, I'm going to post, I'll post the reaction paper um, on the Facebook page uh, tonight after class, uh, print it out and have it ready to watch tomorrow during class. We'll do it during class. So we're going to spend about 40, 45 minutes on parking. We'll do about a half hour on the video reaction paper and then the remainder of the time uh, probably 45 minutes that you have left will be for doing the midterm. And you'll have longer if you need to take it. But I find most people can take it in about 25, 30 minutes. So it's really not that uh, difficult. Um, you have chapter two to read. Um, and sections two, four, and seven in the manual. So I want that uh, read. Okay. Now, up on the board, I've got 11, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So when I sign off in the next five minutes or so, I want people texting me what they have available. If you can do any of those times, I'd greatly appreciate it. Uh, also, I think if you have any time on Thursday, if you want to get a jump start, if those times don't work, then we'll do Thursday too because uh, we got to really start um, putting this together. Okay, because like I said, tomorrow is the halfway point with the classroom. And we don't have class during April vacation. So just uh, remember that too. So the remainder of tonight, I want you to do your reading. Get your homework into me. Chapter 12 was for today. Some people gave it to me before class. If you still got to send that to me, send that along to me so I can take a look at it. 
Uh, if you've got any questions about anything that we've covered or anything about the midterm, uh, do that in this last half hour. This is your time to work, to study, to do your stuff. But for tonight, this is all the material that I have for you. And we're basically caught up. So we're ready to rock and roll tomorrow with the midterm. So that is it for tonight. Uh, please, please sign up. Like I said, I don't want to hunt people down, but I will be begging and pleading. So have a good night and we'll see you tomorrow for the midterm.